Good morning and welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace. My name is Andrew Wilder. I'm the Vice President of the Asia Center here at USIP. I'd also like to thank all of you who are joining us virtually today. Um, I'm not sure how, f I think most of you are familiar. I certainly hope you're familiar with USIP, but for those of you who are not, uh, we are just about to celebrate our 40th anniversary when we were founded by Congress um, in 1984 um, as an independent, nonpartisan public institution uh, with a mission to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict. Um, it's my honor today to welcome Ambassador Abdul Ghafoor Muhammad, who was appointed the Maldives Ambassador to the United States uh, last fall, and he arrived in October a year ago. Uh, before becoming Ambassador to the U.S., Ambassador Ghafoor served in many senior positions at the Maldives Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including as Foreign Secretary and Permanent Representative of Maldives to the United Nations. And most importantly, I just reminded him, we were classmates at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and we're meeting again for the first time after 35 years. So uh, it's good, good to welcome a fellow Fletcherite to USIP. Um, USIP is delight, delighted to host Ambassador Gafur for conversation with USIP visiting expert Nalanthi Samaranayaka uh, to discuss the U.S. Maldives relationship and other political developments in the Maldives. Uh, this year has been an important one for U.S. Maldives relationships as the Maldives reopened its embassy in Washington uh, in June this year. Uh, and in July, the U.S. Senate confirmed the first U.S. ambassador to the Maldives. Uh, as the U.S. contemplates how best to implement its Indo-Pacific strategy, the Maldives, with its strategic location and relationship to great powers in the region, plays an important role. So there's lots to discuss today, and I'm sure there'll be a rich discussion. And we'll start off by having uh, Nalanti and Ambassador Gafur engage a discussion, and then we'll open it up for audience uh, questions and a uh, discussion with all of you. So again, thank you all very much for coming today and joining us. And with that, I um, invite Ambassador Gafur and Nalanti to the stage, and we'll kick it off with Ambassador Gafur making some initial opening remarks. So please welcome to the stage. Ambassador, please. Thank you. First of all, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Andrew, for that uh, very kind intro introduction. Yes, we were classmates in Fletcher. It's, a, it's an ear I have always valued and remember very fondly. Uh, although it was, I wish it had been two years, but the Fletcher experience is something that has always stayed. And it doesn't matter how long you have been away and whenever you meet uh, Fletcher, uh, another Fletcher, Fletcherite, you always feel that sense of kinship. And thank you for uh, arran arranging, arranging this event and giving us an opportunity to speak about the Maldives and the U.S. Maldives relations. I understand you want also to know a little bit more about the uh, Maldives presidential elections that is still uh, ongoing. <coughs> Excuse me. Before I uh, go into the uh, main topics, let me first give you an introduction about the Maldives. A background. The Maldives situated about 450 miles southwest of Sri Lanka, comprises of uh, almost 1,200 islands, of which 200 are inhabited. Uh, well, more accurately now, I think it's 186, because some of the islands we're trying to uh, sort of make it less. Mm. Uh, we became independent in uh, 1965 and soon after becoming independent in 1968 the country held a referendum and decided that we would uh, opt to become a republic. So we moved from a sultanate to a presidential system of government then. Uh, the, the then Prime Minister became the president. He, he served two terms and uh, resigned and said uh, he will not com contest a third term. The next president, President Mohamed Abu Gayoum, he became president in 1978 and served for 30 years, six 
six successive presidential terms. By the time I think uh, Moldovians had become fatigued about having the same uh, president for, for so many years and um, the country changed to a multi-party democracy with a, uh, uh, with a two, uh, two term limit, limits on presidency. The first multi-party election was held in 2008 uh, and uh, the, the then government soon uh, was uh, had to the president had to resign after about two and a half years but uh, the next election was in 2013 uh, and uh, the new government came in uh, president yamin uh, who was actually the half brother of president gayum before in 2018 uh, we had the uh, said third election under the multi-party system. Once again, the government changed, and now we have the 2024, uh, the fourth election, and it remains to be seen whether the current government president can actually uh, win a second term, or will the uh, government be changed in the coming days. The when Maldives became independent in 1965, we were one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, we were an LDC, uh, one of the uh, 16, least, uh, 16 poorest countries. But over the years, uh, including through the uh, third year regime of President Gayoum, whatever one criticism, criticisms one might have, we did manage to uh, develop <coughs> quite well and uh, we uh, graduated uh, to a middle income country in 2011. And nevertheless, we still remain a very vulnerable country. This vulnerability was uh, very much on shore in 2004 when we had the tsunami, and about 60 percent of our economy was uh, wiped away in a matter of minutes. At the same time, because it's a small uh, economy, uh, because it's also resilient, we are able to come back uh, very quickly and rebuild our economy. Uh, when you speak about, about our economy, our economy is based primarily now on tourism. Uh, that is a fairly uh, new in industry. It's, it's only 50, 50 years old. The first tourism uh, tourists arri began arriving in 1972 and uh, with very basic infrastructure at the time. In fact, uh, in the 70s when the uh, country looked at the possibility of having a tourism industry, we were told then by international experts mm, that tourism is not a viable industry in the Maldives. It was too small to uh, isolated, not enough transport and communication, and no infrastructure, and said that is not a possible industry. But 50 years uh, later, I think we have one of the world's best tourism industry, uh, and uh, celebrated right around the world. In fact, we uh, uh, achieved the leading destination status for successive three years over the last three years. So. It's, you don't, <coughs> we learned very early on, you shouldn't always l listen to international experts. You should listen to your instincts and carry on and do the work. Uh, <coughs> I don't, I really want this to be a more conversation and I mean, I can go on talking about my country, uh, but that is not, and uh, I wouldn't know whether that would be of interest to you or not. So I would rather uh, be uh, happier to field questions and respond to the queries you may have about the Maldives. And I'm sure you would have some idea of Maldives ha having taken an interest to be in this uh, uh, event here. So I would not treat you as being totally ignorant of Maldives. Therefore, I don't think I have to give you a long uh, 
explanation about motives. So with that, I would uh, give the floor to Nilanthi, so you can go ahead. Thank, thank you, Ambassador Gafur. Uh, we, we appreciate you sharing a bit of the, the history of Maldives and taking us into the, the contemporary mm -hmm. era. Uh, the presidential election, that's mm -hmm. the most timely aspect mm -hmm. of our discussion today. As you mentioned, Maldives has conducted multi-party presidential elections for the past 15 years. We saw a record number of candidates contest in the first round a little mm -hmm. over a week ago, with a second round coming up at the end of the month. Can you share your thoughts on what observers, particularly here in Washington, should take away from the election process that is unfolding now in Maldives? Thank you. I think uh, the presidential elections this year actually did show certain uh, some interesting uh, statistics. Mm. Well, unlike you know, 2018, when we had just two candidates for the presidential election, this time we had eight presidential elections, which is a record. Uh, five of them, five of the candidates were from political parties, and three were independent candidates. Uh, but uh, among the two major parties was uh, Democratic Party of Maldives, Maldives Democratic Party (MDP), and the other uh, P PPMP and C, which is the Progressive Party of Maldives, and. People's National Congress, they have a uh, joint uh, partnership, those two parties. Mm. Then there was the Jumhuri Party, which has usually played a kingmaker role in uh, 20, 2008 and 2012, when we held the election. They were the third largest party. And depending on who they sided with, the, uh, that, part, that side won. So both when Pre President Nasheed won in 2008, he had uh, the support of the Jumhuri Party. And similarly, when President Yamin won in 2013, he had the support of the Jumhuri Party. Usually, they have been able to uh, get about 12-15% of the vote. Under the Maldivian elections, uh, a candidate must have 50% plus one vote to uh, be declared the winner. So it, uh, in order to get uh, that 50 percent, no single party has been allowed to, uh, has been able to uh, garner that, that much with, with, without the support of a third party. This has given rise to a kind of a coalition politics, which is actually not recognized in our constitution, and it, which is not part of the presidential system. So although it's a presidential system in Maldives, in some characteristics there are uh, a parliament system uh, practices that are being, that you could see. The, what happens is when, uh, even if they form a coalition, once you, once the president has been elected, he is not duty bound to keep, uh, to res uh, respect the coalition. And the coalition uh, has failed both in 2008 and 2012. But in 2018, when President Soli won with the coalition, he was uh, very keen to show that even under presidential system, he can work with the coalition, that he would respect the coalition arrangements that have been made, even though there is no uh, legal basis to that. Mm. And for the past five years, he so uh, he was uh, governing with the coalition uh, intact. But uh, when the presidential, presidential elections came, unlike maybe his, uh, what he thought, uh, his, his calculations didn't seem to have held because all his coalition partners uh, decided that they will also contest, contest on their own, which is why we had so many uh, candidates. In the, uh, in the, at the same time, because of his uh, 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 interest in keeping the coalition together, it also uh, has cost somewhat his own party because a number of a certain group people in his own party, they were not all that happy that he was conceding so much to the other coalition partners and the 
Modern Democratic Party has becoming uh, ended up splitting with President Nasheed, uh, one of the most iconic uh, political personalities in the Maldives, leading the uh, what they became, what came to be known as the Democrats, and President Soli uh, holding on to the MDP. In the elections that held, President Soli was able to achieve uh, thirty. 9% of the vote and uh, to the surprise of many the opposition party they got a 46% of the of the vote the conventional wisdom had been president Soli would do a lot better than that but uh, perhaps because of the anti incumbency factor or because the, perhaps the mdp was taking things a little bit too much for granted and uh, as they said after elections they were failed in uh, pushing people to the uh, uh, electoral booths mm, and they were not as uh, robust in their uh, push for getting the vote, vote, uh, voters, voters out. Uh, they didn't do as well as they had hoped. The Democrats under President Nasheed did surprisingly well but still not as well as some people ha might have thought because uh, being who he is, in one might call a giant in Mauryan politics, uh, his party gained 7% of the vote with 15,000 votes, which is uh, the third largest and yet not that many when you consider the, uh, the largest party won 101,000 votes and President Soli won 85,000 votes. So 15,000 votes is a very distant third. And the party that usually had played the uh, kingmaker role was far behind. He became, in fact, fifth with, uh, with uh, I think, about 2,000, 3,000 votes. And in fact, an ind independent candidate doing better than him, getting, getting the uh, fourth position. So. Uh, post election there has been some jostling trying to see if anybody uh, who would join the uh, parties join the two parties mm. obviously each uh, uh, candidate is keen to garner the support of the voters mm. uh, that had turned away from them but uh, so far they have don't, they don't seem to have succeeded in uh, getting the smaller party this time coming on board the uh, one, of the, one party has already declared that they will uh, stay neutral uh, the from the what is happening last couple of weeks I would say most of the others would also remain uh, neutral without taking sides they see that they are uh, their future in developing their own parties depend this, this time on not joining a party and trying to establish their own identity rather than becoming a uh, small um, sort of minority party in the larger party. Mm. The election is going to be hold on, held on 30th of this month. So there's a lot of, uh, as in any election, there's a lot of politi uh, presidential or uh, political pledges uh, being thrown around. I mean, each one is sort of promising to take you to the moon and back. Mm -hmm. And how much these promises can be kept once they come into power is uh, remains to be seen. The modern electorate is quite mature. They are used to elections. Even though we may have had uh, a multi-party election since 2008. We have, have we've been having elections for a long time, uh, and um, they have usually, uh, especially since the uh, 2008 elections, the people have made very mature decisions, and they have been very brutal on governments that has not delivered to them. Also, I think uh, the, they are also tired of 
party politics in the sense of splinter politics and are keen to uh, get a more stable form of government, more stable political system. There's currently a debate going on uh, about whether we should have a presidential system or a parliamentary system. President Nasheed has been campaigning uh, very vigorously to try and uh, change the current electoral system to a uh, parliamentary system. But uh, this was a decision that was taken earlier on in 2007 before we had the first multi-party elections. And at the time, by a margin of 60-40, roughly, the people decided for a presidential system. But uh, the argument uh, the Democrats led by President Nasheed is making is that it's been 16 years. Uh, the experience has not been all that good under the presidential system of governance. And the Maldivian electorate, given the country's history and geography and makeup, it's more, it'll be much more feasible to have a parliamentary system. Whether his views will be shared by a majority right now, like last time, remains to be seen. The, uh, they've, uh, they've asked for an election, uh, a vote on this, ref a referendum on this issue in between the two uh, elections, now be before 30th of uh, September, which obviously uh, most people have said is impossible. Mm. And I don't see this happening, but perhaps uh, in the months to come, there may very possibly be a referendum on uh, whether we should continue with uh, a presidential system or a parliamentary system. One other thing I'd like to also emphasize is our electoral uh, elections commission and our uh, ele uh, elections vote counting. I think we have a very robust and strong uh, elections commission quite independent and it is very difficult in my view to rig the election in the Maldives despite uh, what the losers might say because our elections uh, uh, the vote counting voting is done in all over the place in very small uh, electoral booths like uh, last time we had 574 electoral boxes mm. And each of these box is counted at the place where the votes are cast. And it is counted in front of uh, representatives from both parties as well as election observers. And the uh, result is announced then and there. So consequently, uh, the election results are known in about three, four hours. I mean. This time in, uh, by about 8.39, it was quite obvious uh, where the trend was going. And by 9.10 o'clock, uh, one could declare who had won the election. So uh, that is election rigging is something that I personally don't think is possible in the Maldives. Even if you play around with that, you couldn't play with more than one or two percent. And if the difference between the two candidates is more than two, three percent, then I think the election results would uh, remain valid. Uh, I think with that I will... <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Ambassador, for taking us through your, your detailed assessment mm -hmm. of the, the considerations and the, the procedural issues, and especially with this discussion mm -hmm. about the presidential system versus the parliamentary mm -hmm. system. I, I think all of us are going to be watching on September 30th to mm -hmm. see the, the results of the, the second round. Uh, I want to ask about India and China. Mm -hmm. This was a topic that was a, a prominent uh, <coughs> feature of the discussion throughout the campaign mm -hmm. uh, in the election. Um, and more broadly, Maldives is a smaller sized country that has to manage these mm. very large powers in the region as mm. it tries to conduct its own foreign policy. Mm. So can you share your thoughts about how Maldives approaches this geopolitical dynamic as it mm. conducts its foreign policy? Yeah, this is a question increasingly, increasingly being asked. 
the Maurice has always had very uh, close relations with both India and China. I mean, China has been a developed partner of the Maurice since our independence. In fact, uh, Taiwan was one of the first countries, uh, Republic of China then, to have a resident ambassador in the Maldives before it became Taiwan and China. Mm -hmm. Republic of China had their first resident ambassador. Uh, India, obviously, we have uh, historical links over centuries and even after independence, the relations between Maldives and India has considerably become closer. It became, it started becoming much more closer uh, following 1988. In November 1988, there was uh, an incident where mercenaries tried to topple the government. At the time, the government asked for help from India and Indian assistance. With the Indian assistance, we were able to, uh, the government was able to thwart this. That gave way to a very robust uh, defense cooperation between the two countries. Uh, and India Morris Defense Cooperation has been uh, sort of uh, developing since then uh, very closely. Uh, Chinese interest and Chinese in, uh, activity in the Maldives has been usually in the social sector. They had uh, the first housing development projects in the Maldives were done with the Chinese assistance. They also had in the uh, 90s some solar, small solar projects. So interaction with China and India, Maldives is quite uh, used to that. And it has never been an issue for the Maldives perhaps until very recently, when some uh, political personalities try to make this into an issue. Uh, the, there was a, uh, this became more pronounced during the time of President Yamin, when he was able to gain uh, funds from the Chinese to build a bridge between Mali and Hulu Mali. That obviously uh, sort of stood out also, he was able to uh, gain a lot of assist uh, financial assistance from uh, the Chinese for other infrastructure projects as well. Now, this was a time India government and the world government uh, had, or, or the pr President Yamin's government had some issues with the Indian government, mm, uh, mainly because uh, the India being a Commonwealth country and being a democratically uh, inclined state uh, was more, in, more prone towards making a statement about Maldives' situation at the time because uh, President, there were a lot of issues being raised internationally about human rights issues at the time. And uh, the jailing uh, imprisonment of President Nasheed uh, by President Xi Amin's government. Uh, these kind of gave impression that the China was playing an, a much larger role in modern politics and India was be, uh, being sidelined. But even President Yamin had a very uh, strong India first policy. And uh, there were diff the difference was he was unhappy about the Indian government at the time sometimes making statements about the human rights situation in the country. Yeah. And uh, during President Solis' time, the, the roles has reversed a little bit. But once again, the relation with China continues. None of the Chinese projects has been stopped. China, Chinese companies continue to win projects in the Maldives. But Indian presence has in, uh, increased under President Soli in the sense the Indian funding, a uh, uh, line of credit over 1.1 1, 1 billion, if not more, being made available to the country through which there is another Greater Mali connectivity project which gives rise to a building of a bridge uh, and other infrastructure projects. The, the Interaction between India and Maldives is much more pronounced, much more uh, sort of robustly seen, has been seen last 
uh, during the last five years. But I would also like to point out that the India first policy that is being and pursued by the government, successive governments in fact, is not the same as an India only policy. India first does not mean India only. It means, uh, from my understanding, India first means that we would be cognizant of India's interests in the region, uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, when we uh, pursue our foreign policy interests as well. So we would not want to come into uh, conflict with India uh, when we pursue foreign policy. But at the same time, we have also pursued very close uh, relations with other countries, including EU, including UK, US, even China. Uh, and right now, we have established diplomatic relations with over 180 countries. Uh, our um, policy is based on friendship with all. As much, uh, being a small country, we cannot afford to have enemies. We want everyone to be friends. We want to be friends with everyone. And especially large, powerful neighbors. India is a powerful neighbor next door, and we wouldn't want to be uh, unfriendly with them. It's obviously a lot more, lot more helpful to us to have India as a friend than India as an enemy. Similarly, we wouldn't want China to be our enemy or Ch to have unfriendly relations with China. It is to our advantage to have China as a partner, as a friend. And we believe, uh, dis despite this uh, issue being exploited by certain political uh, figures for their domestic politics, which is a bit unsavory and not quite right, I believe, that the larger uh, picture is that our relations with both countries are quite uh, quite good. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that. I, I think that this topic of how Maldives pursues its foreign policy with India, China, and, and various mm. other uh, powers, and like you mentioned, the EU mm. as well, I think that's, that's a topic that uh, observers are going to continue mm. to, to be watching uh, with, with regard to how Maldives uh, does it. Uh, I want to take some questions from the audience, but uh, before we do that, uh, Maldives-U.S. relations, mm. the, the past year has been, it's really seen an uptick mm -hmm. in, in this bilateral relationship. Uh, you have recently helped to reestablish Maldives Embassy here mm -hmm. in Washington. Uh, the U.S. has also dispatched its mm -hmm. first ever resident ambassador to Maldives. Uh, can you share your thoughts on, on these developments? What, what, what do they all mean? Well, the Maldives has always recognized the U.S. as the uh, most powerful country in the world. And it's important to have U.S. on your side. Mm -hmm. uh, soon after gaining independence, in 1965, uh, when we uh, joined the UN, there were questions raised about the viability of having such small states as UN members. And uh, in fact, uh, we ended up being approved, uh, the becoming a member, and that opened the way for other small states to join the UN. So once you have accepted Maldives into the UN, there was no way you could not take in uh, all the Caribbean or South Pacific states when they became independent. And currently, I think uh, almost a third, uh, if not more, of UN membership comprised of small states like the Maldives. Even at the time, uh, we recognized the importance of US to be uh, a friend. The first, this is why I think the Maldives um, become, once they became independent, they opened up their first embassy in, in the US, first resident embassy. We always had an embassy, uh, a representative office in Sri Lanka, so that automatically became the uh, Maldives embassy in Sri Lanka. But in 1968, US, uh, Washington was the first embassy that Maldives built up in. Very far away, very expensive for a small country and proven right, we couldn't sustain that. And we covered UN from Washington at the time. 
and uh, later on uh, we could, as we said, we could not sustain that. And once again in uh, 2007 we tried to establish a resident embassy in the Maldives. This coincided with a very politically uh, sort of happening time in the Maldives. And 2008 was the multi-party election, elections and when the new government came mm, and also along with it came the uh, economic crisis, 2008 econ economic crisis. Uh, the government felt we didn't have the resources to have uh, embassies so far away and that we could cover once again the or continue to cover Washington from UN and uh, as it turned out I was appointed as PR to UN and covered Washington uh, from New York from 2009 to 2012. Uh, the US Maldives relations uh, has always been on good terms and we have never had issues with the US. The values that two countries have have been similar, uh, commitment to democracy and human rights and US has been very supportive always of Maldives uh, democratic journey uh, from, from the beginning. Uh, you know, some of the more uh, things that come to mind, the U.S. support for Maldives, like when we had the 2004 tsunami and we were devastated, the U.S. was quick to send President, uh, President Bush and Clinton then to the Maldives and they acted as ambassadors for Maldives um, in trying to uh, uh, so revive the Maldives tourism ministry. As they said, if you want to help Maldives, go there, mm. travel to the Maldives. Mm. And that was the best uh, tourism promotion we could have. Mm. Uh, in the last few years, uh, Maldives engagement with US has increased, especially since this government uh, came in. And with the, it has coincided with the US interest in the Indo-Pacific as well, which has been uh, to our advantage. We uh, welcome the very uh, keen interest that US is taking in the region and subsequently in the Maldives as well. We have uh, uh, a number of projects uh, in the Maldives that are being assist assisted by US uh, in terms of like the uh, addressing plastic wastage, uh, climate change, uh, renewable energy, and also in helping to strengthen our democratic governance and transparency in financial uh, government, government finances. And all these things are lay the basis which will strengthen our democ democracy and our institutions. And uh, in monetary terms, I think what used to be about uh, three to four million dollars uh, invest. Uh, assistance from USAID has increased to a commitment of over 50 million, I believe, uh, over the, through the signing of DOAG last couple of years. And uh, as I said, we saw this becoming more concrete last year with the opening of the uh, more, our embassy in Washington here it was uh, encouraged and assisted by very much uh, uh, the Secretary of State and the U.S. government. Uh, we welcomed the U.S. commitment, uh, U.S. announcement to open up its resident, em resident embassy in the Maldives when uh, Secretary Pompei visited in 2019? 2020. 2020, yeah, just before the COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, just la a few days back, mm, we have had the first U.S. resident ambassador present his credentials uh, to the president. Uh, the official opening of the uh, U.S. embassy is yet to happen, but it's uh, already functioning anyway. So the formal official opening will happen quite soon. So I think all these things uh, represent a growing 
uh, interest uh, to uh, forge close relations between the two countries. It's something that is very much welcomed by the Modian government. Thank you, Ambassador. We'll now take some questions from the audience. So, uh, yes, Professor yes. Olapoli. Thank you, Ambassador, for uh, that overview. Um, on U.S., just to continue on U.S.-Maldive relations, uh, despite the recent activism, I think you can say, it's fair to say, U.S. has been a relatively latecomer to Maldives. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it seems to me that uh, a lot of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy is what is driving relations with Maldives, and in turn, that U.S. relies a bit on India as one of the key players to, for its success in the Indo-Pacific. Now, in that case, you know, we do see, you, did, you, uh, you kind of uh, uh, alluded to this, but uh, there is some hyper-nationalism that tends to be directed mostly toward India, mm -hmm. not toward China, or not mm -hmm. toward any other country, so India, which is important. And secondly, at the same time, we see a deteriorating U.S.-China relations. So you do have these equations going on, and I wonder how whoever comes into uh, power at Maldives, how do you think they'll be able to handle this, and what are the implications? Thank you. I don't know. If, should I be speculating on this? <laughs> no. But yes, uh, well, you said uh, U.S. is a latecomer. Um, I think U.S. physical presence, presence in the Maldives has been late, but U.S. has always covered Maldives quite closely from uh, Colombo. The our embassy in Colombo has been covering Maldives, and Maldives-U.S. relations and uh, interaction has always been quite uh, frequent. Mm. There has been talks, mm, the ambassadors visit the Maldives quite often, and when our, uh, our uh, ministers uh, travel to UN, they often travel on to Washington and have uh, discussions and talks with State Department. Mm. We have had other senior uh, U.S. figures visit the Maldives as well. But yes, you're right. There has been a much more intense uh, and more frequent interaction with the U.S. over the last uh, few years with the revival of uh, the interest in the Indo-Pacific. That is, I suppose, quite expected. The uh, relations with China, India, and U.S. Uh, I think for an outsider, to view this uh, from an academic point of view can be quite interesting to analyze and have all kinds of uh, theories. But for Maldivians, for any Maldives government, as I've said before, uh, we can't afford to annoy any one of them. We can't afford to be not friendly with US or China or India. We need to be friends with all of them. And I think it's also something that of, uh, they also understand. We are a small country, uh, but a very strategic location. Something that is not lost on us and that is uh, always emphasized by the larger powers. So what we do and how we behave, our foreign policy is closely watched uh, by the powers. What we want to see in the Indian Ocean is a peaceful, stable Indian Ocean. Because unless we have a peaceful, stable Indian Ocean, then uh, the, we would be the first to be uh, affected negatively by that. We depend on tourism, means friendship, hospitality. So unless we have a stable uh, Indian Ocean, a peaceful Indian Ocean, we would not be able to have a robust tourism industry. And uh, China is one of, uh, not one of the uh, uh, largest tourism markets. India is or largest tourism market. US, you might not believe, is the seventh largest market for Maldives. I was surprised. Mm -hmm. It was the sixth in 2022 and currently is the seventh. And there is a possibility of this growing further. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, despite what might be, uh, sort of what might be happening locally, and some people trying to uh, play the uh, India-China card. Mm. I don't think 
any government would fall into that. Hmm. That would be something that will be always happening uh, as kind of, kind of a sideshow. But in the larger framework of government policy, uh, the relations with China, relations with India, relations with US, this will remain, always remain important and government will be wary of taking any policy position that would affect negatively on its relations with any one of these countries. Am I able to? <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Professor Payne. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks. Um, I don't mean to keep on harping about the future, but another existential crisis for the Maldives, um, as well as the entire world, mm. is climate change. Um, what, from the Maldivian perspective and from the current administration, is the aim for Maldives vis-a-vis -vis climate change, both for it as a nation and throughout the Indian Ocean? What are some of the priorities that partners of the Maldives should, should give greater emphasis on targeting? Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. As you mentioned, climate change is the uh, existential issue for Maldives. Our islands are only about four or five uh, feet above sea level, and these are also very small. So any rise in sea level can impact us very badly. Same as the uh, global warming that affects our coral which then affects the uh, ecological system and our food stuff for fisheries. These have negative impacts and threaten our survival. In many ways, uh, we are at the forefront of being affected by climate change. And some have often talked about uh, Maldives becoming climate refugees. Although this is not something any Maldivian would accept. We do not intend to move from Maldives and we don't see why we should. Mm. Uh, we will uh, learn to adapt and this is what we have been uh, calling on for the international community uh, to uh, address these issues. These are global issues and it can only be confronted through global action and commitment to 1.5 degrees. We keep on harping about that, pushing that forward, although more and more uh, it seems it is unattainable. But uh, we are also uh, calling on more com emphasis on adaptation com measures and help uh, countries like the Maldives uh, to adapt to changing uh, climate environment. Mm. It is for this reason we were very happy and welcomed the US uh, coming on board the Paris Accord once again. You know, that's something we felt very strongly. Uh, Unless you have countries like um, US, China, India, EU, all these countries on board in addressing, addressing climate change issues, it, it would be impossible to uh, move forward to find a solution for this issue, uh, uh, global issue. Uh, we're looking forward to the uh, 2000, uh, the, in December, in the Dubai, is it in Dubai? COP28 in Dubai, where uh, there's the, uh, the fund that has been recently or trying to establish, uh, I can't remember the name of that fund. Loss and Damage. Loss and, loss and Damage Fund, yes. Uh, and we hope that this will come into uh, fruition during that time and will help uh, the smaller countries to address the challenges that are forced by uh, climate change uh, measures that are being that are uh, that are that are facing, especially the smaller countries and low-lying islands. Are there any more questions? Yes, Dr. Dan Markey. Thanks, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I understood from your your sort of uh, political analysis uh, of of the upcoming elections. Uh, that the India-China issue is in some ways a sideshow or a distraction uh, or it can be used uh, politically to, to mobilize. But I'd like to better understand what the other issues are uh, that you didn't really get into. Mm -hmm. I mean, you identified the various parties and so mm -hmm. on. But what are these elections actually being contested over? 
Uh, frankly, in so many of the reports here in the United States, you know, the focus really is on the broader strategic uh, map and where the Maldives fits into it. So it'd be very useful to hear from you what the issues are that, that uh, Maldivian voters are actually uh, focused on uh, more firmly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <coughs> there are a few things that the Maldivian electorate has uh, focused on last five years, uh, during this last election. One has been the disappointment that they, fe they felt with the government. This government came in with high expectations, very high expectations, after a very turbulent period. They wanted peace, stability, a clean government, and they wanted also redress for some of the injustices that happened uh, during President Yamin's time. So, one issue that has been raised time and again is the government's uh, inability to have addressed these issues. Mm. When the government came in, uh, the one of the first two commissions that they established was uh, there was a commission on asset recovery, President's Commission on Asset Recovery, and under the Presidential Commission on uh, investigating certain uh, unexplained deaths mm, which had happened during that time. Unfortunately, the work of uh, the both of these uh, commissions has not uh, come, uh, been known to the public. The public is unaware. They have done a lot of work, they have made reports, but the public is not quite satisfied with the work that was done and that they felt that these two commissions have not delivered on the promises President had made at the time. That has been a disappointment. Uh, another is the issue of corruption. Uh, the one thing that is really that stands out is the COVID. During the COVID, the government did an excellent job in uh, dealing with the challenges challenges of COVID. I mean, a small import dependent country, we managed to uh, ride out the COVID without any shortage of food or medicine. Uh, we had the uh, borders closed only for about three months and still tried to uh, revive the uh, tourism industry. Following COVID, I think we were one of the fastest growing economies. So did did quite a good job. But on the other hand, because it was done so well, people didn't really feel that government had lost three years or two and a half, three years in trying to uh, deliver on the pledges that they made in 2018. So it was very easy for them to say, these are the things you promised, but this has not been delivered. And during the COVID time also, there was one incident where people felt uh, certain groups had made undue, taken undue advantage and had established uh, sort of engaged in corrupt practices. And these uh, issues take an overblown uh, uh, characteristic. Mm? So those disappointments remain. And to that, obviously, uh, the another issue was the uh, exploiting this China-India and the Indian dependence. The opposition had been uh, trying to portray that the government had become too much or over dependent on India and Indian influence is way too much and uh, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation through the social media but uh, that the issue of threat to sovereignty in a very in small countries is a very sensitive issue the concept of sovereignty Mm. Because we like to feel, even though you're small, that we are independent, you are sovereign. And any indication, uh, any kind of um, allegation that our sovereignty is threatened uh, is going to become very sensitive. Unfortunately, I don't think government has uh, always uh, robustly challenged this very false allegation that has been made because government was quite uh, content that we, our sovereignty is not threatened. 
we are not over dependent india is a friend a special friend partner but our uh, sovereignty and our independence has always been uh, quite robust we if you look at the uh, un voting patterns you would see Maldives and India votes don't always coincide, especially in recent times on the Ukraine thing. Maldives have voted uh, very much on its principle of not uh, uh, compromising the territorial integrity of nations. I think India uh, has voted, what um, has been on uh, abstained on some issues. We have always voted negatively. When if in we were so much dependent on India we would have had to vote with India. And India has always respected uh, the Maldives' independence. And, but unfortunately, India being a large country, and this is, I think, an experience, something experienced by all of South Asia, especially smaller countries. Uh, whatever India does can be very easily misinterpreted by all the smaller countries. Mm. It doesn't matter, let's say, when India sneezes, the rest of South Asia catches a cold. Mm. Uh, it's on 90% of the territory, if not more, and resources. This is India in, in South Asia. So other countries become very minuscule compared to that. And these issues uh, the has sometimes been exploited. And I think uh, in, a, in this election too, that sovereignty threat and uh, to a lesser extent, the Islam, mm -hmm. the threat of uh, Islam being uh, sort of wiped off the Maldives, so our religion being compromised in the country. Maldives has been for 800, 800 years a 100% Muslim country, and this is something very uh, fiercely guarded by Maldivians. The Maldivian identity is very strongly intertwined with being a Muslim. And so the Islamic identity and the national identity are one and the same. So when people try to uh, exploit that issue, that government has not been protecting the Islamic religion, has not been protecting sovereignty, uh, these things uh, can play a part, small part. But remember in the Maldives, even 5,000 votes can make a difference. In 2018, when President Nasheed lost to President Yamin, the difference was less than 6,000 votes, I believe. So the, the religious group can command about five to 6,000 votes. The, uh, those who engage in uh, misinformation, disinformation, they can uh, influence five to 6,000 votes, and that can make the difference. Well, our hour has come to an end, but I would like to thank you, Ambassador Gafour, mm -hmm. for speaking to just a, a range of issues from Maldives' domestic politics to climate change uh, and to, of course, Maldives' U.S. bilateral relations. Uh, thank you for helping to increase our understanding of how Maldives approaches uh, its foreign policy and, and, and larger issues uh, in, in the international space. Uh, I'd like to thank my thank colleague, uh, give a shout out to Isha Gupta for managing logistics for today's event. And thank you everyone for, for joining. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.